<laughs> we need that summer of love spirit right? here. This is good, good, good tune for the times. Future is blowing in the wind. Yeah. <laughs> <For sure. Right. laughs> But which bloody way is yeah. it flowing? <laughs> you hell no, he's <laughs> Oh, see, I brought the I brought the queen for you today. Ah, yeah. Oh, excellent! Had a good British contingent here. Very much a British contingent. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I don't know what number this is, but this is our uh, second week of doing post-talk live salons. That song of Peter, Paul, and Mary, I think Tobias is probably the only one amongst you lot that knows this, but um, I used to work up on a farm in Mendocino County. And uh, I remember this came up, Tobias, when we, we did the urban farming evening. And I remember people would sing this song in the evening <laughs> around, <laughs> around the campfire. Um, anyway, thank you so much. The topic today is our food system right now. And um, we have a crowded group of folks here, but um, I thought everyone had so much to add. Um, folks from all different worlds. So Tobias Peggs is the CEO and co-founder of Square Roots, which is an urban farming company that uh, is based in New York. He'll tell us more about it. And he co-founded that with Kimball Musk. Chloe is a staff writer at Forbes, where she covers food, drink, agriculture, and billionaires, maybe less of them now, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Always Claire, billionaires. Yeah. Claire is the CEO of the James Beard Foundation, which we have all heard, and um, we will understand more why we can appreciate them so much. And then Jed is a friend of mine from up in Northern California, um, and he is right there at the front lines as a uh, longtime restaurant owner and, and very popular restaurant owner with, with uh, loyal clientele. Um, so I thought we could just, you know, we will have a conversation, but um, I want to start off with you, Tobias, because I also know you need to bounce earlier, perhaps, than, than the others. Can you tell us just, so for folks who don't know what Square Roots is and what urban farming is, because it's very sure. different than industrial farming. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll caveat this by saying everything I'm about to say made a ton of sense two weeks ago, and like, who right. knows, but... Um, it, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, you know, in the normal times, most of the food that we eat in this country has been shipped in from thousands of miles away. You've got absolutely no idea where it's come from. Uh, food that travels that distance takes a lot of time. And during that time, bad things happen to the food. You know, the nutrients are breaking down into sugars, etc. Not to mention the impact of the planet from all of this distribution. And, and so Square Roots is really an attempt to figure out how we can get locally grown food to people who live in cities mm -hmm. on a global scale, right? And by 2050, 70% of what will then be a 10 billion person planet will be living in cities, right? So it's kind of a bit big issue to, to, to solve here. So the way that we're doing that at Square Roots very simply is that we built a, a, what we think is a scalable urban farming platform where number one, we got a very clever farm tech uh, component where we're essentially building farms inside uh, refurbished shipping containers that we can literally put down in a parking lot at the end of your street. And inside those containers, we're essentially programming some climate from around the world that is optimized for growing a certain crop, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're growing delicious basil like this, then we'll look at the climate in the north of Italy in the Genoa region where that Genovese basil comes from and literally figure out, again, peak basil growing season, you know, what's the temperature profile in the day? How cold does it get at night? What's the CO2 level, the you know, nutrients, what's going on? Basically program that into the box and then grow that same tasting basil for you. But now we can do it in Brooklyn and get that food to you the same day of harvest. And because we're doing that indoors, we're able to do that all year round. So in, in essence, that that's what we're doing at Square Root. So we have a farm in, in Brooklyn serving New York. We have a farm in Michigan serving Grand Rapids and Chicago and other areas. Um, and then, you know, we might get into this, but we have a very interesting program where we bring in young people and train them how to be farmers 
uh, and really more than farmers, more like future leaders in the local food system. Because if this thing scales, mm -hmm. then it's going to need more than square roots to build a global local food system. Right. And so the more of us working here, the better. So uh, we, we spend a lot of time investing in that future generation of farmers as well. Okay, I'm going to come back to you and ask and who those who those farmers are, and perhaps can any of us um, become a farmer? Claire, tell us about the James Beard Foundation. We've all heard of it. Um, but maybe not everyone knows what uh, the James Beard Foundation does, both from the consumer, the person who loves going to restaurants like me, or um, say the farmer or the restaurant owner like, like Jed and uh, yeah, like Jed. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Susan. Um, so the James Beard Foundation is one of the leading nonprofits in the food world um, in the US. We're probably best known for the James Beard Awards, which is the annual celebration of the food industry, chefs, restaurateurs, media right. leadership. Um, but our mantra is good food for good. Um, and everything we do is in support of a better food system, one that is diverse and sustainable for all, but also in support of the industry, the independent restaurant community and industry. Um, and as we all go through this crisis, so many industries are being you know, profoundly impacted, but um, the independent restaurant industry uh, like none other. And so all of our energy and focus at the foundation right now is redirected to support our industry get through this. Mm. Do, you, can you have, do you have any stats uh, that you can give us? Maybe, maybe not. That's a yeah, I have lots of stats. Oh, <laughs> so in terms of the scale of the, stats, of the industry, yeah. um, so the independent restaurant industry, that's your local kind of community restaurant. Um, restaurant. So the small independent one-offs or small groups, not the, the large chains of restaurants. Yeah. And there are about 480,000 restaurants across the country. Um, wow. They are a huge employer. Uh, they employ directly about 11, 12 million people. Um, and then all the cascade benefits to the farmers, the distributors, the suppliers, etc. indirectly. They contribute um, a trillion to the economy, representing 4% of GDP. So this is a critically important sector economically, but in terms of the social connectivity and social tissue. And as we see this, you know, with the with restaurants shuttering, it's going to be so important that they're back up and running to help the healing of communities um, as we go forward. What a um, great point. That is a great, that is a great quote right there. <laughs> And then there's other stats which are very salient at the moment and, and heart-wrenching. Um, over 7 million people in this industry have already lost their jobs um, because of the impact of COVID. And in fact, just when the, um, the mandatory closed shutdowns were being imposed, uh, we at the foundation conducted a survey with 1,500 chef restaurateur owners to get a sense of what is the scale of financial help that's going to be needed to see them through this critical process, um, period and then at the end of it. Um, and it was very salutary. This is not an industry that has deep pockets or sits on big cash reserves. I'm sure Jed will talk to this later on. Um, but you know, last month's bills are paid by revenues generated today. Mm -hmm. And so they're very exposed from an economic perspective. And as a workforce, um, many of this group um, who are employed by the industry don't have full health insurance or paid sick leave. So, so exposed from an economic perspective and vulnerable from a workforce perspective. And having done this questionnaire, 60% um, of the people of the respondents said that they didn't have sufficient operating capital to, to withstand closure for a month. 75% um, of respondents in those jurisdictions where there were forced close downs, shutdowns, um, think that they're going to be unable to operate after two months. And then the money is needed to, for a three month um, lockdown and then a rebuild, hopefully at the end of that, the numbers are between you know, 125, 250,000 per organization. So the level of financial relief needed for this critical sector is huge. Um, we're talking you know, 120, 150 billion. Um, and so as we're thinking about the big federal packages, it's that order of magnitude that this industry needs. Mm, okay, thanks. Thanks for that. We will get back to you in a second because I want to know what you what you're doing. I know you've launched a, re a relief fund. Jed, tell us tell us what's going on. You have how many restaurants up in Marin County? You have yeah, we've got three restaurants. I mean, like okay. Mark was saying, you know, two two months ago was completely different, and it is now. We we started. We closed one restaurant and are running takeout out of the other two. Okay. We're kind of floating on them a little bit. We did start a relief program up here with a high school girl who is, it's very similar to Feed the Front Lines in New York, and we're distributing to hospitals and supermarkets. People yeah. Work online. You were so great. You were so wonderful during the um, Jed, Jed's uh, 
restaurants. They were so great during the Napa fires, providing food. You're always so involved in the community. So There's usually a girl involved that gets you involved. And <laughs> we were brought in uh, and somebody had a contact up in <laughs> the police department. We were bringing 250 meals up every morning during the fires. And it was, it was pretty awesome. It feels good. Yeah. Hey, people in the restaurant business are usually in it to to feed people, you know, and what they want to do is continue doing it and find creative ways to keep doing it, however that's going to be, right? Right. So we've reinvented ourselves, I would say here, we've started two new businesses in takeout, which really are there to protect the businesses that we want to go back to. The takeout business is completely different than a regular restaurant business has been, but it's a means to an end to get back to it, to it, to it later. We have to build back end ordering systems and, change our menus and see what people want to order. And it's, it's been kind of, it's been fun and challenging, but it's been a lot. And yeah. like, right. I mean, we've laid off, I would say about half of our staff and the other half is still working. Uh, we're about a third of our uh, sales right now, but we're floating. So it feels good. feels good that's, to be working and fighting for it. That's good. That's good. Chloe. Hi, you cover all of these, but I also know, um, so I suppose, are there any stories right now that we should know about or any questions you have, um, for these folks, but any, any stories that you're working on right now that, um, we might've missed. Uh, I just posted one yesterday about hazard pay. Um, and I want to keep the focus what's, on restaurants right what's now. What's hazard pay? I don't know what that is. So Hazard pay is this really interesting um, type of bonus that um, has typically been reserved for military workers or minors because it, these are just dangerous jobs. Um, but the conversation really started um, when a lot of the nationwide stockpiling happened and some of the shelves were being laid bare. Uh -huh. And folks started realizing, you know, these grocery workers are on the front lines of this crisis. Right. Um, so, they've so, it, so, well and so they've been getting raises um, and, and that's been great. Um, but I, I started writing more about how there's so many other workers in our food system who are maybe more unseen, but just as important mm -hmm. um, to our food system in this crisis, like farm workers and slaughterhouse poultry processing workers. Um, and, and, and these communities are just now starting to push for additional pay. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we'll see, but it'll be, it'll be problematic if it, if it doesn't come. And, and does that include companies like Amazon and Instacart? Um, yeah, there's been so many walkouts this week because of these reasons. Instacart workers sure. are asking for $5 additional in hazard pay along with a lot of other things. Um, Amazon workers got a little bit of a bump, but they're still not happy. And, and I, I mean, it makes sense. These are very dangerous. This is a, a crisis and they should, they, <clears throat> my reporting keeps coming back to these, like this like one main point. Um, this crisis has really exposed a lot of the ugly truths about how our food system operates um, and made has made a lot of people confront it um, in, in a way that they haven't had to before. And, and that's been amazing in a lot of ways. But these people, the, the workers in our food system have always been essential. They've always been essential to feeding us. It's not just because they're essential right now. Mm -hmm. We've always relied on them, but now we're seeing them more. And they also now we're, now we're now we're really relying on them more than yeah. we ever had. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and perhaps as a result, they'll have more of a voice than maybe they've had at, at other times because they are so essential. Um, so Tobias, quickly on the, what the, who are the farmers at, at Square Roots? Because it's it's a little different. Yeah, from so the, traditional the, farming. Yeah, the the. The, the you know to answer specifically we we put together um a training program that we call the next gen farmer training program it's a 12-month program where typically young people kind of you know, i think the median age is like 23 um make their first start in a career in local food systems right maybe that's agriculture maybe that's something else they work with us. There are employees for 12 months. They get paid, they get benefits, um, and they work in the farm, right? And we surround them with our technology, hardware, and software, and a training program that we've invested in and developed a lot. Of. And basically, we can get a person with you know, a lot of passion about changing the food system, a motivated person, but maybe one with no experience growing food. And we can get them from like zero to being able to run one of our modular farms in about six weeks. It's pretty amazing. And then over the course of the year that they're with us, they grow the food, we sell the food, that's how we make money. Uh, but we also provide training throughout the year on everything from seed to sales, and then also entrepreneurial training, marketing training. These people will learn the ins and outs of a PL and how to position themselves. And the idea is at the end of the 12-month the program, 
they're then ready for an incredible career in local food systems, right? Many of them end up staying and working at Square Roots. And as we scale and build more farms, they then help us set up those farms. Uh, but we've had graduates from Square Roots, for example, go to Stone Barns, right? And learn about soil agriculture. We've had graduates from Square Roots get the entrepreneurial bug and want to set up little farms that, you know, themselves in the, in the area. So it's really becoming known as you know, the the program now uh, to start your career in local food systems so there's kind of be, agriculture then. There's going to be a lot of people who, there's already a lot of people who need jobs. Um, yeah. are, you, are you looking at that as um, an opportunity for Square Roots to grow, say, in Marin County where, where, where Jed is based? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I sort of flinch at the word opportunity being yeah. used uh, at all in, in these situations that it feels like very icky growing food is a great thing growing food is a great thing yeah totally right before this program or sorry before the, this uh, kind of pandemic right we were already thinking okay well what other types of cohorts does it make sense right what about uh, military veterans what about you know older people seniors that like, you know can we uh, can we do this um you know we already get thousands and thousands of applications every time we open one of these programs, right? And every time we open a program and there's like 10 slots. So it's like a very kind of high demand thing. I, I think that will increase, but yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for you, but you know, to, to Claire's point, you know, several million people have just been laid off in the services industry. Right. As Jed said, these people like their whole reason for being is to bring food to the community right and so maybe now there's a chance to think okay i'm not going to cook it i'm going to grow it right and and you know how can we become farmers and get really close to the root what's well, your relationship right now jed with the farmers well that's you know in marin we're a little more fortunate because we have farmers all over Marin. <laughs> and if you cut off and i think everybody now that's looking at their food supply we're one of the few counties in the country that if you cut off the bridge we could feed ourselves right yeah we, massive amount of you know agriculture in western marin we you know if you have a burger here the bread's you know milled in uh central milling in penaluma it's baked in stinson beach the burger comes from uh marin county through stumple creek and so they deliver to us it's it's amazing we're going to deliver i think kyle our chef was talking to star out farms which is in bolinas and they're going to use us because we're open as a csa distribution on Thursday for 3,000 families who live in Mill Valley will be able to pick up their stuff here and hopefully buy beer and a, you know and something else from us. But it's we're, we're really fortunate in Marin to have, to be in a place where we grow everything. We don't grow pineapples and bananas and you know some things, but we could live, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Directly to us, it's great. Claire, I know um, James Beard Foundation has launched a relief fund. What What is going into that and where is the money coming from for that? Yeah, so I mean, we recognize that the key priority now is fundraising, both in terms of helping this industry lobby at the highest level to ensure that they are priority recipients of this federal relief. But at the same time, we recognize actually they need cash in their hands right now. So we launched a relief fund, a food and beverage relief fund just 10 days ago with um, founding support from San Pellegrino and Patron. Um, we, we launched, we opened the application window just on Monday with $2 million. So the money has come from a number of brands and hundreds of individuals who have donated towards it. Um, and within the first few hours of opening to applicants, um, we had over 4,000 applicants made. So we actually had to shut the window just to manage um, expectations and manage the inflow. So we are issuing um, a series of one-off grants of $15,000 to individual restaurants which have fewer than 100 full-time, part-time employees. It's a very simple process. Um, so this was the first wave and we're looking to be cutting checks either the end of this week or first thing next week. So it's, it's essentially an emergency relief um, and so we've done the first wave of that. Um, and then the next wave is all about fundraising. So if anybody is watching this today and ca they care about your beloved local restaurants and you want to see them there at the end of this, when we're celebrating life again, um, please donate. And it's at www.jamesbeard.org forward slash relief. Yeah. Where, where else should um, the funding be coming from? 
Well, I think it really is, it needs to come from um, the federal and state level. I mean, so much money um, being released at the moment, rightly so, unprecedented levels of economic support. Um, but unlike big other kind of uh, industries like the airline industry or the oil and gas industry, our industry, the independent um, yeah. restaurants, is a, is a group of, you know, as we said, hundreds of thousands of individual organizations. So the lobbying efforts need to be really concerted and united in their voice and in their ask. Mm -hmm. But I think principally that's where the that's where the the the, the most sizable money needs to come from. But individuals, consumers, um, patrons can all do their part. As Jed said, you know, it's you can buy gift certificates if they're doing takeout, buy loads of takeout wipe it all down but do take out there are dining bonds there are whole numbers of ways that you can support your your restaurants through this and there are lots of gofundmes at the local level and at the city level there's, um, in marin, I was, like besides the besides the one we're doing which is feed the front lines marin which was started by a high school senior at tam here um and then we're going out and feeding supermarket workers and people at the hospitals and stuff i think heidi over at ensaladas in san anselmo she's got one set up there's one in sausalito uh where they're feeding elderly people i mean the the restaurants are they're givers you know they're out there to, and, and it's everywhere you know and you can find it pretty easily local organizations feeding you know, local needy people it's pretty cool and it, it's not just that they're givers though, right? I mean, I think the, the point I think we, we need to make is there's so many scary closures happening. There's so many layoffs, but there also are so many restaurants that are continuing to press on and, and trying to survive through this crisis. Sure. Right? Can you speak to them turning into um, selling things directly from um, from farms and sort of turning into groceries? Do you, Have you noticed any of that, Chloe? Oh, oh, totally. I mean, there are so many, uh, I mean, in New York, even we had a lot of um, restaurants selling their wine inventories just to, to give their staff funds back, right? These are crazy wine lists that were going for like yeah. nothing. But um, with farming, I, a lot, there's a lot of um, uh, collectives happening and, and local kind of uh, like produce um, sellers that were, you know, maybe at the farmer's market and now those aren't being um, foot trafficked as much that we're selling to the restaurants as well and now doing a lot of CSA type deliveries. There are a lot of other restaurants that have turned into these more like bodega general store type concepts just to, you know, service the community with what they have still in their inventory. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really popping up a lot. It, the, the distribution channel for restaurants is slightly different than it is for grocery stores. So there are stockpiles of certain types of food sitting, not getting distributed to grocery stores. And I don't know if anybody's figured that out but we've got cases of toilet paper if anybody wants them, you know. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, completely. I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, everyone's saying that, yes, we have enough food, but the problem is that we don't have the right food going to the right places. And we have a demand shifting way too quickly for us to be responding to it properly. And that's when you start seeing all these things like food waste coming up, which is absolutely, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate to see food waste increasing right now amid this terrible crisis. In yeah, it's, it's though, right? pretty interesting, right? Re retail demand, obviously, <clears throat> you know, massive spike because everyone was hoarding the last couple of weeks. That, that seems to have calmed down a little bit, but it's still kind of, you know, 20, 30 percent higher than what, um, you know, we were seeing two weeks ago. But what, what we're hearing, you know, from our perspective, actually ordering from retail stores is very volatile. Right, it'll either be give you give us everything you got or we can't talk to you this week. And 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 kind of what we're hearing is that obviously at the store level, you know, there is an ability to add more workers, kind of you know, expand capacity, restock shelves. The issue is actually further down the supply chain, right? Where the distribution centers are already built for maximum efficiency under normal circumstances, right? They run 24-7 and in an in an era, especially where we have to ensure that. If we're adding people, we're doing that in ways that also um, um, still follow social distancing, et cetera. You just can't cram more people in there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people just having to make decisions in the distribution center about what gets to the store. And it's like, you know, a very kind of random set of decisions that are being made right now. Mm. Um, Claire, how do you imagine, how do you see uh, restaurants? <laughs> The opening. I mean, rest. We will always have restaurants. What do you see over the next three or four months? Assuming that people could start going out in the summer. Um, I think it's. Um, I think it's. It's lots of variables at play. <clears throat> I think it's great that Jed is is keeping you know afloat and keeping them open. I think if for those who can 
keep a baseline of activity and can keep enough revenue to <clears throat> keep the operations going, then it, it, those will be easier to kind of start to grow back up. I think yeah. for those who have been shuttered and have had to lay off all their staff, that rebuild is going to take time. Um, but equally, the demand is going to look different. I think we we're all going to have quite a legacy of this muscle memory of not wanting to be in great proximity and crowd. So having to think about how do you factor that into how you configure these spaces. But equally, if we're heading towards a recession, people's disposable income is going to look different. Um, so I think on both sides of the equation, um, there are real considerations. And at the foundation, you know, we are all geared to help from both the B2B perspective. How do we help our community through this? What are the materials? What's the financing? What's the best practice? Um, but equally, from a B2C perspective, how can we encourage um, diners, consumers to get out there again and, and really help this revival and this rebuild. Yeah. Um, Chloe, uh, any trends with, with regards to different age groups? Um, millennials traditionally not enjoying cooking so much. Are they... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Are they, um, they, they <laughs> a revival in services like Blue Apron, right? Literally Blue Apron was a penny stock when this year started. Right. And now... Yeah. Their stock has, I think, at least quadrupled, if not more, last I checked. Um, wow. I read about Daily Harvest last week. They've been already on a tear and have seen demand surging even more. Um, no, it's it's no secret that millennials don't want to cook. And the millennials who do want to cook have been buying, uh, you know, uh, items like Brie Jones um, and, and other, you know, uh, things that you want to show off on Instagram, right? But I, I've seen a lot of um, interesting pieces this week just about um, how that's the thing of the past. Like we're all just trying to survive. We're eating food to survive now. And it's it's, it's actually taking millennials um, in an interesting direction, um, which I've been excited to see. For sure. Yeah. I think, you know, what else is interesting that we've noticed, like we changed our menu. It was all comfort food for the first, you know, 10 days or something. It was uh, smoked ribs here and meatballs and large pizzas. We don't sell a lot of that stuff, but we started selling it. And mm -hmm. starting to just, as far as survival for restaurants, we're starting to introduce, we're going to do a date night uh, meal at Watershed, right? And so- I was going to ask like creative ideas. I want everyone to give you creative ideas. Okay, so date oh, night. I think so many. So many. When you're stuck at home every day with your spouse is really funny, I think, right? And so, but you can give it to a friend and you can order it for yourself or you can send it to a friend and we'll deliver it. Um, but we're starting to get more into healthy foods. We're doing chicken stocks and different broths and people are starting to take care of themselves after that first reaction of, oh my God, let's just eat every, you know, eat everything. And people are getting fat and drinking. If you want to kind of steer them into healthier kind of diets, right? Yeah, it, it's I also- pretty, uh, pretty, in, pretty interesting, sorry. The, the, I had a conversation on Friday with a guy called Richard Pennycook, who's the um, chairman of the retail consortium in, in the UK, right? I wanted to find out what was happening back home. He's, you know, I mean, he's advising government at pretty high level. and. One of the things that he was saying is in 2008, financial crash, obviously that was about money, right? And we headed into recession and, and people after that were just flying towards value, right? I don't have money, I need to eat cheap. Um, you know, I just need calories as, as quickly as I can get them. And he thinks that that event put the organic movement in the UK back by 10 years. And he was saying wow. only recently were people in the UK beginning again to think about sustainability and health and where does my food come from. What he's seeing here already, though, is that because this you know, is not just about money, it will be about money, but it's also about health and it's not discriminating and it's global. We're all kind of in the same boat. And he's saying like already the consumer is asking, where is this food coming from? And do I trust this food to give to my kids that, you know, all of a sudden I'm seeing 24 hours a day, whereas, you know, sometimes I, you know, I wasn't seeing that before. And so he's saying, you know, post COVID consumer, maybe in the UK is actually going to be a lot more health conscious and sustainability conscious, um, you know, certainly than they were after uh, 2008, but like maybe even more so than they were before this pandemic hit in. It's just a very interesting point of view. And location, right, Tobias? Because, you know, I mean, if, you, if everybody's thinking about the borders being shut and all this stuff, I mean, don't you want a strong, healthy, local food source, right? 100%. I mean, to that point, though, but Tobias, um, freezer sales have been going soaring, and actually in the UK, people have been buying second, third freezers. It's the sales of freezers went up two hundred percent this month yeah. alone. Wow. Yeah. Um, but I, the thing about frozen food, which I think people are just starting to realize today, is that it's actually most nutritious when it is frozen right off the vine, right? Or, or exactly. 
it doesn't yeah, have to be gas in a warehouse and, and taking trucking for months. Um, yeah. So I think the surge is actually making people think about frozen food for the first time mm -hmm. in, a, in a really mm -hmm. interesting way, which mm -hmm. I've been excited to see and it because it is just actually more nutritious oftentimes. Yeah. Claire, what's the most creative um, uh, fix that you've heard of over the last couple of weeks, whether it's restaurants or, or anyone in the food industry? Um, creative fixes. I mean, there are some, it's the... Um, it's the good old, I forget the name of it, but the chickpea liquid that you can use as an egg white substitute. Oh. And people are making meringues. Oh, no. With that. <laughs> 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 Apparently, it's, it's an excellent alternative. Okay. Jed, well, yours is date night, Jed, right? What, what have you got coming up? Can you can you tease us what's happening up in Moran? Well, I think, you know, I think we're going to start bringing in fish. We use two-by-C fish here. It's all, you know, sustainably caught and stuff. But we weren't putting – nobody was buying it. Everybody was buying cheesy pizzas, right? So now we're, like, right. introducing, you know, a nice, beautiful lentil and, you know, uh, you know, char or something like that and, you know, package it up and have a little date night. Send it to your friends. Oh, I love I love the date night, the date night side. Chloe, I know you're working on another project. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, um, no, I'd love to. So um, to your question, um, so uh, we recently featured Kopitiam, which um, it was just, uh, nominated for a James Beard Award, but it's been in Chinatown, my neighborhood for five years. They're selling um, kits now for um, in, of their favorite condiments and Kaya jam toasts. Um, so you can make it everything at home. I've seen a lot of people trying to do these make at home um, uh, takeout um items but um we, we featured them on a, a broader package that we we've been launching this week which i'm really excited about it's called help our neighborhood restaurants it's um been started by forbes but we are building it as a coalition the new york post is now working with us and oh, we're aiming to be featuring um at least one neighborhood restaurant in every single New York City neighborhood. Um, we're working with Kyrie Irving from the NBA and Chef JJ Johnson um, on this board. And um, we're gonna be donating it um, one for one uh, Beyond Meat Patty to the food bank for every meal served. Um, and really the point of it is to be spurring delivery and, and helping the restaurants that are still hanging on and are still struggling. Um, and so it's through storytelling, it's through the donati donations, and it's through this kind of safety checklist, which our restaurants sign on for, um, which is a lot of things that, you know, these restaurants are already doing, like, you know, having PPE and, um, you know, giving paid sick time um, and, and not having staff come in when they're sick. Um, but we're really excited about it. And we've already been hearing that it's been really um, boosting some of these these longtime neighborhood institutions. I know you're involved are right the now. ones that are struggling most right now in a lot of ways, but they're the ones who are trying to hang on the most too. How many are involved right now? So um, we launched 15 stories last week. We'll be launching at least another 15 on Friday. Um, and we'll be getting to a few hundred, thanks again, hopefully to the New York Post and a lot of others. We're trying to build this as a coalition um, and just get the word out there as much as possible, getting just just trying to get people to do delivery and, and support these neighborhood gems before they don't go. We launched last week um, a little bit of a fire drill we launched because we were really just worried that you know, a lot of these restaurants wouldn't hang on after the weekend. Sure. Um, and, uh, but their stories of resilience too. A lot of them are, you know, immigrants who have come here. A lot of them are telling us that they're only hanging on right now because they're selling to the hospitals or the, they're giving donations to the hospitals and their, their workers are coming in for warm meals after their shifts or, um, or that, you know, um, they're hanging on for their for their workers that started out with them right in the beginning. They've been with them for 20 years. Um, it, it's a stories of survival that we're trying to tell and, and, and excite people about who are the, the ones to support right now. And we're looking to try and find as many people in all the boroughs as possible who we can support in through the effort. That's we can help you with that, Chloe. Uh, oh, Claire, I'll connect, I'll I'll connect all of you guys on email on email afterwards for sure. Tobias, you are the ultimate to me entrepreneur. I think I met you three companies ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I was wondering what, where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it in a great way. Um, so, I mean, you've seen lots of pivots uh, throughout your career, but what in terms of creativity of of any anyone sort of in the food industry that that you've uh, seen over the last couple of weeks where you're like, wow, that's a great quick pivot. Well done. Have you have you come across anything? You've probably been so immersed in your own world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we, we, we have, honestly. Yeah. Um, Are you doing farm we, boxes? Do you provide um, things for farm boxes? No. So what what what's interesting? Sorry, I'm going to answer your question of what are other yeah. people doing by answering with, hey, here's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but um, 
No, I mean we the, the the you know we have we got a farm here in New York and a farm in Michigan. The farm in New York um, services the retail industry, right? So we grow the food, we package the food. Uh, the farms in Brooklyn, we're very close to hundreds of different retailers, and we literally jump on battery powered bicycles with climate wow, control okay. units on the top and cycle around town and get the food out to the. You can the, get around much easier right, right now in New York, right? Yeah. So, uh, so <laughs> hanging in there. You know, we, <laughs> we, we had to make changes there because, uh, you know, to, to sort of in, ensure social distancing protocol, you know, basically we had to reduce the number of people that were inside the farms, right? Same size space, less people, more space per person, and then re-engineer the workflows pretty rapidly so that we could, you know, still grow food for the community, but do that in a way that was safe for the farmers. Let's kind of reduce the capacity somewhat, uh, understandably, but we're running the same model. In Michigan, that farm there was geared to the restaurant industry. I see. Right? And so overnight, that you know demand evaporated, right? As kind of you know Claire, Claire knows and, and and Jed knows. So you know there was a much more kind of dramatic exercise there to you know quickly spin up a, 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 re, a retail uh, business. Um, you know I'm sure we're not the only you know farm that 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 has gone through that, but. Um, uh, you know, those, those have really, those have really been the innovations as I talked to, you know, many other, not just indoor farms or, or, you know, vertical farms like us, but greenhouses and others. The key question that people have is, you know, we've planted this food. We need to harvest that food. But weeks ago when we planted it, we assumed that we could have all these people in harvesting and now we can't. And so what are we going to do about that, right? As an outdoor farmer, that is a major, major problem, right? If I can't have, you know, my people in there working at close proximity as they used to, I'm going to have to leave half of that food in the ground and let it rot, right? At least with an indoor farm, you know, it's all hyper-controlled, right? So you can just dial it down a little bit and you grow less food, right? And broadly speaking, you, you can kind of do that in a way where there's no food waste. But as an outdoor farmer, like we're, we're sort of looking towards incredible food waste uh, on the horizon. And, and to your point, right, I mean, these farm workers are often working in really cr close lines, really close quarters. I've heard from several of the farm worker unions this past week, none of them have, have given any safety trainings, none of them have given out PPE, there's no hand sanitizer. Um, and, and on top of that, you know, a lot of times they're living in communal housing, where there's yeah. a communal kitchen and communal bathrooms, and yeah. things can spread extremely quickly in a situation like that. I mean, there's a huge... Uh, if if it spreads in these labor communities, it, we will have a significant food issue. And to your point, that's why your your company helps to secure that a bit more in other vertical farming operations out there, right? Yeah. Well, thank you guys all so much. I really, really appreciate you taking the time out of um, your day to come to come talk to all of us. Uh, so, so, so appreciated. And um, I'll connect all of you guys offline on email so you can stay in touch. Um, so tomorrow I am going to be speaking with Zach Williams to to Lisa Birnbach, who is the um, the editor and writer of the official preppy handbook. So we'll be definitely moving in a different direction tomorrow from, from today. We'll be taking, we'll be going in a, in a lighter direction tomorrow. Um, so I hope you can tune in and many thanks guys. Thank you so much for joining today. I know you're super busy and um, we really, really appreciate it. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Great tune again. <laughs> How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? How many times can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? Blowing in the wind, the answer.